one of the four ISIS brides who was repatriated back into Australia in October last year has been arrested and charged for entering declared zones under Islamic State controlled in Syria, which is a breach of federal law. Mariam Murad faces up to 10 years in jail if she is convicted. In October last year, a very controversial announcement was made that we would repatriate four ISIS brides and 13 children back to Australia, whose husbands went to fight in Syria, whose husbands have either been killed or are in jail. I think it is very important to note that Mariam Murad, the one who's just been arrested, her husband went to Syria to fight alongside the Islamic State in 2013, and she then joined him a year later in 2014. What, in my opinion, rules out the idea that she was tricked into going. This is a very hard topic to talk on, because I think both sides have very solid arguments. These children are Australian citizens. But these people also turned their backs on Australia. But should Australia turn their back on Australians? That is the argument. That, and that is a hard thing to answer. That, you know, should we enter the slippery slope of repatriating people that could be radicalised or who have turned their back on our values and supported, in a way, the terrorist organisation against us? That's a slippery slope. But then there's also a slippery slope of do we turn our back on Australians when they do something overseas that we don't like? And these same husbands of these women were shooting back at Australians who were involved in airstrikes from the coalition, who wanted to see the fundamental reality of the West collapse and wanted to kill people like you and I. At what point is there a personal responsibility laid for if you go with your husband here and you take your children, where does that responsibility start and end? Shane, thank you for coming on and speaking to me. You are, I guess in my world at least, a subject matter expert on talking about this. And the more research I did into this topic, the more I knew I needed someone who was, I guess, outside of the media uh, and I guess theirs, like their opinions and outside of the general public, because there's so much more in this that I don't think people understand. And on the surface, it can just seem like, you know, what the hell, what the hell are we doing this for? And that was my initial reaction too. But the further you dig into this, the more things, I guess, or there's the, the less you know as you go in, but then it's some things actually start clearing up. So Shane, thank you very much uh, for coming on and chatting to me today. No, anytime, really, you know, especially, um, this subject, uh, you know, as we've previously discussed, it's very close to me, um, you know, I'm very passionate about, you know, especially getting, getting, uh, you know, I've spoken about this before, getting, getting those children out of those camps and supporting, you know, those mm. children. So Shane, can you give me a quick background on who you are, what your involvement is, and I guess your credentials on being able to speak on this particular topic? Yeah. So uh, as you know, you know, I was in uh, the army for... Well, you know, I pretty much joined in 95. Uh, spent the last 10 years in the Australian Intelligence Corps uh, focusing on the um, uh, terrorism groups and their ideology. Uh, when I left Defence, I uh, started working as a senior intelligence analyst for a counter-violent extremism uh, team in youth justice in New South Wales. And I didn't know much about what CV is. I just thought it was all, you know, counter-terrorism, but... CVE is pretty much the left and right of a terrorism incident. So intervention, assessment, uh, understanding the ideology, um, things like that. So my role in youth justice was actually going into jails and interviewing uh, terrorism-related offenders to write reports for the court, whether it be parole, uh, sentencing or uh, intervention strategies. So were they actually um, a, a violent extremist or were they just trying to... Uh, get a bit of status within that environment. Um, then that led me to do some uh, consulting work and some training of some other government agencies on what is uh, what ideologies uh, exist. So what's the difference between the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban? Uh, uh, what does that look like in Australia to, to a Middle Eastern con uh, context? Um, I did some work with the uh, Foreign Fighter uh, Task Force when I was in defence 
So that was, I was actually looking at the Australians that left and were operating inside the Islamic State and their uh, circle of families. Um, and then um, I started looking at, obviously, the camps, the, the Australian youth, because I at, at Youth Justice I was, I was involved in the youth. And then uh, more recently I've been um, working with organisations and families on the repatriation or assessment um, firstly, of those Australian citizens and their, their children still in those camps in Syria, and then the repatriation. Uh, you know, I've been on the project, uh, Channel 9, Sky, discussing these these uh, very matters, especially at the end of last year when those women and children were first repatriated. So I guess in a nutshell, mm. um, you know, yeah. Well, th well, that's what I want to talk about is, and because it's flared up again, because in the past 24 hours, uh, one of these Islamic State brides has been uh, arrested and charged. Uh, and as you told me before, this under section uh, 119.2 on visiting areas deemed under federal law that you cannot go in Syria. And what, what I want to talk to you about really is what is actually needed, you know, of bringing these people home is... I think a lot of people have this idea that we've the Australian government have walked into Syria, gone, these people are Australians, bring them home. How much background checking is there? How much um, intelligence is gathered? And due to that, how can we be assured that we have minimised the threat to the public of people that uh, have been around radicalised um, Islamic State fundamentalists and not bringing that into, into Australia? Okay, so the first thing I want to thank you for using the word threat, not risk, because I'll get back to that, and that's key. But um, so the women and children that were repatriated in the last year weren't the first. Yeah. There were two families and some children that were repatriated in 2019. Um, there was suppression orders around that, so I'm very limited to what I can talk about. But if you Google that, um, uh, some media outlets have put a fair bit of that information in the public realm. So it wasn't the first time last year when it was done by um, the new government, which uh, if, and if you heard me at the time, especially on the project when I called Peter Dutton a liar, uh, I was pretty frustrated at the time because he was the Home Affairs Minister that first uh, repatriated a family and then the hypocrisy of him getting on media and having a go at the new government, um, I just thought was disgraceful. So basically... Uh, there's a couple of things here. The um, uh, Australian government has always tracked Australian citizens that left Australia to join the caliphate. Um, the various intelligence agencies and other organisations, uh, I'm not going to get into it, but it's all on Google uh, if you want to have a bit of a look. Uh, but um, so, for example, I was... Uh, one of the first intelligence analysts into Iraq in 2014 for the counter ISIS mission. Uh, and we were aware of what Australians were uh, in that um, area of operations. Um, and the government always tracked that because also under legislation in Australia, it was an offence to leave the country to go. So the Australian Federal Police uh, actually would board planes and pull Australian resident, Australian uh, citizens off if they thought they were going. And, um, you know, one of the famous stories was four uh, men from Melbourne were going to drive a tinny, so a boat, up to North Queensland and then drive that boat across to Indonesia and then get up into Syria that way. So there was some pretty determined, all up, there was about 300 Australian men that went... Uh, Firstly, to join Jabhat al-Nusra, so that's our Qaeda, but predominantly most went over and joined the Islamic State. Uh, and then as part of that, um, a number of their uh, wives uh, followed. Uh, the majority of them were coerced. Uh, and this is one of the things the Australian uh, public don't really understand. But if you... Um, do some research or if you understand Sunni Salafi, uh, the, the, the Salafism uh, part of that religion. So they believe that Islam has become corrupted 
and that they've got to go and practice Islam as it was taught by the Prof, uh, during the time of Prophet Muhammad. So they're the very, very conservative. And as part of that, you know, women can't leave the house without, so, without a uh, male. They're fully covered up. Um, so a lot of those uh, wives and children that went, first of all, they didn't know they were going to Syria. And, and I've interviewed uh, a lot of these families. And but, that, but that's where I would I would say that I think with this recent arrest, I, I think, I know you're the expert, but I'd say that is, in my opinion, incorrect. Mariam Rad went to Syria a year after her, her husband was there. Surely there was some idea of what was happening. And with this charge laid, you'd think if they've been able to lay a charge, they've laid it on intent of you knew what was happening. If you've just stumbled in the wrong area, they're not repatriating you, spending a million dollars and then char arresting and charging you on that. So I was going to get to that. And you're 100% yeah. right why Miriam was charged. Uh, because they, the law enforcement, uh, have information that or evidence that they can prove that she knowingly, and this is key, and it's in some of the reporting now, that she knowingly and willingly left Australia to support her mm -hmm. husband and his, because he was a recruiter. He recruited a number of his family members and other people to go and join the uh, Islamic State. One thing that's not reported or known is. There was um, a large Australian hub, we'll call it, in Turkey. Mm. So um, a guy out of Sydney, uh, Mustafa Farad, who now goes by uh, Abu Suleiman al Australia, he was one of the, the top uh, leaders for Al Qaeda. And he had um, a setup in Turkey that was essentially um, a base for Australians. So it wasn't, uh, there were a lot of Australians, especially initially, um, and if you look at someone like Mehmet Bieber, that went to Turkey for, for um, and then went across into Syria for humanitarian reasons, or that was their justification initially. Um, so, and there were a number of families that, that uh, did spend time in, in Turkey. So um, it's not, uh, it is quite, plausible for a number of these women to uh and believable for them to go we're only going to turkey right and, uh, a number of men did leave their families in turkey while they went into and fought uh, and then would come back and see them um so but the key you're 100 percent right the key in this arrest um and it's why they've only arrested one not uh more in the cohort at this stage is because uh, they can prove or they have evidence that she knowingly and willingly, um, yeah. now, whether she took the abaya, which is the Pledge of Allegiance to Islamic State, inside Australia prior to leaving, or if she ever took that at all, is something that will have to be proven before the court. Um, and under the legislation, not 1192, uh, but other terrorism legislation, that must be, be proven that she knowingly and willingly took the abaya, which is... Essentially, yeah, the Pledge of Allegiance that makes someone a member of the Islamic State. Yes. But how can we guarantee that we've had someone charged on this that we've repatriated that has flown to Syria in support or in the areas, at least, of the Islamic State? How, I guess, is the intelligence uh, community guaranteeing, or maybe not guaranteeing, but having some level of threat assessment against these people pose not a massive risk to the Australian community because at least my initial thoughts on this and my thoughts through the research and this have changed dramatically was once you've, once you've done that, once you have got on that plane and you've gone here, you've signed away your, your rights to a, a protection from Australia. We had Australian soldiers shooting, getting shooting and getting shot at on the ground there uh, as well as the Australia, Australia was, um, targeting Australians who were in Islamic State at the time. Um, how, how, how can we be sure that the radicalization of these people, or well, they haven't been radicalized joining the community back in Australia? So, uh, that, again, that's an excellent question. And I guess that's the fear in the community. Uh, and uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to actually answer it properly. So uh, this isn't an overnight process. So these women and children that have been repatriated 
have been uh, assessed, spoken to, interviewed for, for months over there. Um, and those that uh, are working on this um, are very, very familiar with um, A, the law, but also B, um, the ideology and uh, the complex terrain around that. So uh, for me, the reason I got so involved and am so involved is the children. So um, we've, we've, uh, like we've recently brought back Neil Prakash from Turkey, from jail to jail. Uh, and he's an Australian citizen. So one thing is um, every Australian citizen has the right to return to Australia. Now, if you've can, It's no different to when we brought people back from uh, Bali or Malaysia that have, have committed crimes there, and they're doing time in Australia in jail. So uh, she has was being deemed to not be a current threat to the Australian community. Uh, they assessed and, and monitor her on arrival. And if you look at, and, and I really want to stress this because this is being lost and you've got that that complete fool, Frank Carbone, that mayor of Fairfield again, spruiking off uh, about, you know, risk and threat to the community. If the uh, Home Affairs thought that she was a current threat to the community, she would have been brought back. And she has not been charged with any crime that she was trying to conduct um, any form of attack against Australians now. She was recruiting now. It's all uh, pre-repatriated uh, offending. Um, and again, that's why she got bailed today. If there was a threat to the community, there is no way a judge would have given her bail. So this was all pre-offending. Uh, uh, um, but the, the you know, I'm qualified in the VERA to us. It's a violent extreme risk assessment and the trap, which is a terrorism risk assessment tools. Others are within government that have, you know, psychologists uh, that spent a lot of time with these women in the camps conducting these assessments um, and then had to weigh up those risk of threat, which is completely different to um, a risk. So threat is intent and capability. If any of these women had the intent to conduct any form of attack in Australia against Australians, there is no way they'd be repatriated. Um, the difference between what a risk is, a risk can be mitigated, you know, um, but again, if they had an elevated, a high risk, that they were still of the strong ideological belief, uh, that they still felt that the Australians were far, any of these, there's no way the Home Affairs because the Home Affairs Minister has to sign off, sign off on this. So it's no different to um, a 105A application, which is continued detention. Um, you know, analysts and psychologists and investigators put a pack together. That goes to the Home Affairs Minister. And in this case, she goes through all of that, asks all the questions, goes to advisors, goes to experts. And if she feels comfortable that they're, that the Australian community is safe, then she approves it. And that's what's happened in this case. It's not an over... But if there was no risk or threat, why why are they then under 24-hour surveillance? Who said they're under 24-hour surveillance? Uh, on the uh, media, on all the media releases when they were repatriated in late October, because um, one of the big things people are kicking a stink up about is the idea of the taxpayer then paying... 24 hour uh, surveillance on uh, the properties where they were moving, whether that is security from, from the outside in or what? They're, they're not under 24 hour surveillance. There's no need for 24 hour surveillance. Right. There are surveillances in place. But again, this is what I was talking about um, the uh, fear mongering, um, especially from Peter Dutton. Uh, and Karen Andrews and Frank Capone and all these other people had, that had agendas in this. Um, if there was that level of risk or threat by bringing the – because they, they haven't brought everyone home, yes. you know. Some didn't match or meet the threshold or they're still, um, you know, uh, Matt Tinkler and Save the Children um, do some excellent work uh, in uh, continually doing some intervention with these families. Um, and if they, they didn't meet the threshold, they didn't come home. 
it's not like we just rounded up all the Australian citizens in the camps and just brought them all home. Yes. It was a very, very deliberate, stage, planned, assessed repatriation. Yeah. And where does that lie for those who are not citizens? Because from my understanding, uh, some of the men were citizens. Now the men have either been jailed or killed. Um, but some of these people that have been repatriated, whether the children or the wives, uh, were either residents or not citizens, or the only citizen was the father. Now, I understand we can't leave uh, under the UN. You cannot leave someone stateless. But where does the law fit within that? Because I think the argument here, and I'm not saying I disagree with you, I'm just bringing up talking points, is that as an adult, as someone who's done this, you have signed away your your rights when you've done this, as the men did, as, you know, someone who uh, goes, supports this, that, hey, this is out of our hands. So how, where does it sit for non-citizens? So unfortunately, you don't sign your uh, rights away, no. even though yeah. um, when Peter Dutton was the Home Affairs Minister, he did try to legislate that. But right. under, you know, um, no person can be left stateless. Um, they are so those women that married Australian citizens uh, and then had children uh, with him. So what the process was? There's been um, there's been uh, chat groups and constant communication between the Australian cohort in those camps and all the families back in Australia. So those women that did marry uh, Australian men have been in touch with his family back in Australia for years, right? Um, including when they were married, you know. And so the families in Australia have, have accepted them that this is my son's wife. They've had children. Now, again, this is the thoroughly uh, process of the government. They did DNA tests. So they got DNA from some of those relatives in Australia, DNA from the children to prove that they are the children of, a, of an Australian citizen. Right. Um, that was done. Um, and then... Again, those uh, assessments and, and other uh, processes have taken place. The family in Australia had to uh, agree to accept the, the wife and the children into their care. Uh, that was very uh, carefully um, monitored. And again, you know, shout out to, to Matt Tinkler and Save the Children. They've been working on this for years, you know, uh, with, with the, uh, and I won't get into all the organisations, uh, and other, but there is a large group uh, within the community that have been working on this, help supporting those families for a number of years. So when they came back, it wasn't like the families didn't know them, weren't expecting them, hadn't vouched for them, um, and uh, so they came into as you know Australian um, under temporary. Uh, the, the women would have had temporary or have temporary uh, refugee visas, but the children get Australian passports and, and uh, as. The Home Affairs Minister and the Prime Minister have said on a number of occasions that you can't not let Australians back to Australia. Yes. No, I, I understand that. Um, of course, it's just, it's a very controversial topic seeing uh, what their husbands have done and what they were part of. Um, I, I agree. Like, yeah. you get, like I said, I was in the first uh, rotation of Australian soldiers into Baghdad in the counter ISIS mission. Hmm. So I've got skin in the game of like when you were saying that, uh, you know, Australian soldiers were fighting the Islamic State. I, I was one of the first to do that. And I've worked yeah. on over 30 domestic terrorism operations. Um, so I'm in a better place than most to look at or have more to not let them come back and not want them in Australia. Yeah. But uh, my focus has always been the children. I've got young boys and... My boys were in that camp. I'd move, you know, hell on earth to get them out. And um, the government uh, ha I feel the same way about the children and, mm -hmm. and those mothers. Um, what I will say is when and if some of the stories, and there are some ABC um, documentaries on this already, what those mothers did to keep their children together and alive, uh, whether you agree with them leaving Australia or not, is amazing. Absolutely. You think about, you know, in winter it snows there, in summer it's 50 degrees, uh, it's overcrowded, there's actually a lot of violence in there. Um, 
you know, they might speak the language or originally speak the language. They might have a number of kids and they've kept them alive for, for a number of years and and relatively healthy. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, like the camps are disgusting. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Well, but, but the question has to be asked, the, if you wanted the best for your children, you've left Australia, which is – uh, one of the luckiest countries on earth, and it'd be top three countries any refugee in the world would want to come to. You've left that to go and join an Islamic State caliphate and put your children in harm's way directly. Let's break that down, right? You know, there's, a, there's a couple of assumptions there that uh, um, keep getting made in the public space that we've got to really address. Yep. First of all, um, their children were born overseas. Yes. So, uh, and uh, there is a very famous family that actually took their, their children over there, which I won't get into. We all know who that is, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing. But a lot of these kids were born over there, so so they were born in the circumstance. And and two, I go back to this point. Um, if you don't understand Salafi um, Islam, you, you know, if you look at Saudi Arabia or um, we just had the World Cup in Qatar, and they were mm -hmm. talking about the treatment of women there, like um, they can't in their in their um, conservative communities, women can't leave the house without their husband or a male relative with them. They until like two or three years ago, they couldn't drive cars in Saudi Arabia. They can't wear watches. So uh, in that um, form of Islam, they just can't say to their husband, "No, no, no, I'm not going. I'm not." Um, uh, you know, it's very much a um, adherive lifestyle. So it would have been we're going, and like you know, I said and have you know have spoken to a lot of uh, and working on this for a number of years. A lot of the, I'm not saying all. I want to stress that. And Miriam Rudd is a great example of mm -hmm. the other side. But a lot of these women uh, did not leave Australia with the knowledge that they were going to end up in the caliphate. Yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah. And I guess the talk is on this was, you know, the reason we're here is that Miriam Rad because yeah, she left a year after. Um, and, and where does the law sit between this? But that's why um, with all of this, that's, you know, I'm not a, an expert on this. And that's why I really appreciate your time coming in and, and, and clearing up misconceptions that I've got. And I think a lot of people have that are, are, are incorrect or misleading at best. Even originally, right? The original law, um, 2013 and that it, it wasn't an offense to travel to Syria. So mm. uh, if you if you Google Mehmet Bieber, when him and uh, his group of friends first uh, left Australia in 2013, went uh, first to Turkey, then into Syria, that they didn't break any laws there, and they actually came back to Australia. Mm. Uh, and I'll let people Google that and, and look at the reasons. They came back to Australia. No dramas. At that stage, they hadn't broken any laws. When Australia changed the law, that became an offence. So, um, and then again, there were other laws uh, put before Parliament and enacted since then. Um, so you've got to put um, a few things in context, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's a, a case in Melbourne where a uh, guy from Melbourne, Khaled Tamza, he was uh, planning just to go to Kashmir to do some um, do some charity work uh, with a, 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 um, a organisation that's been deemed uh, illegal by uh, the Australian government and he was charged with a crime. So there are a number of offences out there that, that, that capture, um, capture all of this, but it was a staged process. Yeah, and I, th I found it interesting from another guy I spoke to that said that the Syrian Defence Force realistically has said with, you know, the potential ground invasion of Turkey into Syria and ISIS being within these camps, that the ability to actually keep these Australian citizens in these camps safe and and not being radicalised is absolutely, is diminishing very quickly. And the best way to keep them safe and keep them from actually being radicalised within this was to repatriate these people to Australia of their citizens. And like a lot of things, if you break a law in another country, 
they will send you back to your country to be uh, charged with uh, or, or have your sentencing where Syria and this, what this gentleman was saying to me, Syria did not have, or does not have the ability uh, to be able to do this to these people. So it was somewhat of Australia's responsibility. Hey, these are your people who came here, whether it's illegal or not in your country, they've, it's much more dangerous them being in this camp than you could monitor them back in Australia and didn't go from there. So that's an excellent point. And you're 100% correct, right? Um, and Australia's, uh, France, Germany, you know, I've done a, a, a number of, or, or some work um, and consulting with a number of countries that are doing the same thing because you're exactly right. Um, the the people monitoring the camps and the UN basically said, you know, the camps are going to close soon because of um, the hostilities. And if you remember um, last year, there was ISIS uh, conducted some assaults of some of the jails mm -hmm. to free their fighters. You know, the um, original, uh, he was an inmate in a jail that uh, notified what was going on. He was a 17-year-old Australian boy. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's an excellent point. And the Australian community also needs to have a bit of faith in the Australian government. And I think these uh, arrests of Mir Imrad is a, is a great example of that. You know, like you said, if they break it, broken the law, they will face consequences back in Australia. Mm. And she'll be put before the court. And if uh, the court finds that she broke Australian law, she'll go to jail. Just like we repatriated Neil Prakash, who's sitting in a jail in Melbourne. Um, you know, if if the government and like the the uh, JCTT commander said to the media yesterday, investigations are ongoing, and so um, that is, it's not the twenty four seven monitoring of those that have been repatriation, but they are being monitored. They are mm -hmm. um, being uh, in it, or they have been interviewed and. You know, their stories uh, are being checked out. So I just think we need to stop some of the uh, fear-mongering and some of the um, um, sensationalism around this. Let the government do what the government is doing very well uh, and let the legal and pro legal process play out if and when required, just like any other crime. Yeah, but you, you have to be able to see, and not to get into a whole other thing, but you have to be able to see the average civilian's um, idea that the government is not good at what they do because all this stuff at a level is held at secret, top secret, or within small circles in the intelligence community. People's uh, view of the government is what they saw over the past few years of um, complete, uh, like just completely useless at so much. Now, and I think what what is a very big thing to say is, well, that is one part of the government that might control a border closure from state to state. This isn't ASIO. This isn't the intelligence services who are some of the best in the world at what they do uh, and dealing with severe consequences if it goes wrong. So I go back to, um, you know, one of the points I started with. We repatriated two families, women and children, in 2019. Mm -hmm. There was a suppression order placed eventually placed on that repatriation but you know you can google and find that out um, and i think uh um, the home affairs minister may have actually mentioned it at the end of last year but the reason that suppression what it was put in place is so none of this sensationalism took place none of those families have reoffended mm -hmm. they've, they've assimilated into the community they've been allowed to because there's been none of this um you know, mayors getting on there and just going off tangents or or any of this. It hasn't become a political thing. It was done under the radar, done very successfully. So, you know, if they the current um, Home Affairs Minister had a had a um, previous example to look for, what did we do last time? What were the pros? What were the cons? What can we do better? Let's do it better this time. You know, and, and that's what's been taking place now. So I, I would get it some of the sensationalism if it had never been done before but it had and not only in australia it is it's been done now in uh many 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 countries um and like you said it, it's the us netherlands germany france england um some countries england have just got a, a policy come back and all good other countries are going through a legal process but um 
I personally uh, want to get them all out. If they broke laws, arrest them, send them to jail. I'm all about that. Uh, I just, uh, and I think this has to be, um, again, focused on, get those kids out of those, those camps. Yeah, yeah. And you believe that the due, due diligence has been done uh, to maintain the public threat or the potential threat. I can, yeah, yeah. I can promise that. Uh, Look, it is yeah. a daily, day-by-day uh, process, but a lot of that also was done up front before they left. Yes, there is this no was over problem. years too. That, that's, I think, something people need to see is that they're in the camp for years uh, in a in a spot where um, Australian uh, agents can go and talk to them and interview them and do the, the blood testing and whatever, like you said. It wasn't, hey, rip them out now and do it later. It was a period of years that this had taken place. What So think about the uh, evacuation from Afghanistan, right? How much vetting was done? Yeah. Right. Now, you've got to remember that Uruzgan, where we served and fought, is the centre of gravity for the Taliban. Mullah Omar's family lived in Uruzgan. Uh, Mullah Omar visited Aruzgan regularly when we served there. Mullah Barada, who's now the Taliban Minister for uh, Internal Affairs, is from Aruzgan. Uh, Hamid Karzai was from Aruzgan. So uh, 90% of the population of Aruzgan, whether they worked for the police or the army or against us, were Taliban sympathisers. There has been not one... Uh, story or or any of the publicity about any of that mm -hmm. that these repatriated wives are doing. I get why, you know, they let, went to Syria and they fought for the Islamic State. I get all that, right? But these women had a long and uh, professional assessment process. What process were those refugees coming out of or coming out of Somalia or coming out of Yemen? Yes. Um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, uh, no, absolutely. And that I guess that is something that uh, you and I can get stuck into if people would like to um, further down the track. But Shane, look, if there's any closing remarks, I just really want to thank you um, so much for coming on and chatting to me about something that, you know, uh, my scope on is is very limited um, compared compared to yourself. Anytime, mate, because I think this is something that uh, needs uh, to be unpacked for the, for the public because... You know, and I agree with you, and I, and I appreciate that there are some people out there that may find this uh, alarming or, or threatening, and mm -hmm. the sensationalism of some of the reporting isn't going to help that. No, but as as I think you sh people will side on the alarming side, because if you hear ISIS in the title of something, you should be alarmed. Um, yeah, agree. yeah uh, and then, you know, digging into it more, I've spoken to yourself and a few other guys um today in longer in longer chats and the more i find out about how the intelligence community and these academics worked in this space around this the more understanding i was because personally my initial thought process was what the fuck is the australian government doing repatriating these criminals and as i've done it more i'm not saying i agree with any of this and i'm not i'm not saying that people should not be charged or shouldn't be investigated but i am saying well this is how the law works in this country and as long as they're citizens, they're citizens. And we have, of course, the Australian government, um, we we have a duty to do for all citizens, whether you like them, hate them, whatever, of any citizen. If I get stuck in Ukraine or I get stuck in Afghanistan, or if you get stuck there or any one of us gets stuck there, that's part of being part of being Australians. Yeah, I, I agree. And the other thing, uh, I guess my last words are, I'd rather repatriate the women and children and uh, lock all the women up, but get the kids out. Yep. Right. I've got to get the kids out. That's that's been my and is my motivation uh, in this whole process. Um, it's yeah, yeah. So that's why I complimented um, Home Affairs Minister and the AFP yesterday online and for the for the arrest. And it, rather than fear mongering, we should actually applaud them that they're doing that that job. They're not just letting them come back and. And thanks for coming. They're actually doing what the Australian public asked for, uh, and in some ways demanded it at the end of last year. Your comments are exactly the same, and, and that that arrest or this this arrest yesterday um, is to alleviate 
those comments that you've got, and and, and I accept that and, and agree with that in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I guess if if people want to um, dig at the law, the law needs to be to stop these people. If if you want to, you know, you, you can't make laws of something that's already been done. If if people want to say, hey, we should have a law about this. Well, I'm not against that. I'm not against discussions around that. But the law needs to be before you leave. It needs to be, hey, if you fly that, here, right? then you're yeah that and and maybe maybe that's something to be looked at at a high level. But before we go on too long, because Shane, I know you you and I we talk shit all the time, and we could we could go for hours. And everyone yeah. um who who will be listening, Shane is going to become uh a more common face um, on this show as as we talk about more of this stuff and topics that we've discussed in this, we'll go over as well. So thank you, Shane. Thanks, on, brother. Oh, and where can people find you online, mostly on Twitter, if they want to follow your updates? Yeah, Twitter, uh, Terrorist Hunter on Twitter. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much, mate.